instructor here at the historic Hammond Harwood House. And we're really happy that you could join us for this program. All of our virtual programs are free and open to the public, um, as we believe that arts and culture is something important and that enriches our lives. And it's really important to have that, you know, during these challenging times. So with that, we have some more upcoming programs. Um, this Saturday, we have an outdoor architecture tour of two great houses, which is a shared architecture tour between the Hammond Harwood House and the Chase Lloyd House. And we've done a lot of new research about the connections between those two properties. I believe this Saturday is full, but next month we have a March 20th date. So you might wanna sign up for that. Um, and that is in person. We also have a program continuing with our African-American history series. And this will be given next Tuesday, same time, same place. Um, and that'll be given by historian Willa Banks. And the topic is re revealing the presence of the enslaved. So that's um, the 25th of this month at 2 p.m. So if you haven't signed up for that, I encourage you to do so. We also have some ongoing programs. Like for example, we have a program this year called A Message in a Bottle, where we're trying to encourage members of the museum community to write a message to the Hammond Harwood House about how your life is going in 2020 and 21, and then we're going to keep it in our archives. And how cool would it have been in 1918 during the pandemic if, if someone had done a similar thing? So we're, we're hoping to keep those for the future. We're also instituting an outdoor scavenger hunt um, of the architecture in the front with a sign, and we've created a Maryland Avenue scavenger hunt as well. Um, the topic today is of particular interest um, to all of you, as well as us at the Hammond Harwood House. Uh, the topic of enslaved narratives is ex especially important as it gives a voice to the people in history whose narratives have largely been written for them by other people. Um, and the history of Hammond Harwood House is intertwined with African American history from the very beginning, including our architect William Buckland, who had an enslaved craftsman um, by the name of Oxford, named after his home city, who built, uh, helped build the Hammond Harwood House. Um, and moving forward, uh, ne next week, Willa Bank will talk extensively about the uh, Lockerman family's enslaved people uh, who were held at the Hammond Harwood House. And it's interesting to note that the Chase home across the street, uh, the Lloyd family was living there and um, the Frederick Douglass grew up at Y Plantation, which was the home of the Lloyds. Um, and he was enslaved there, where his future wife, uh, Anna Murray Douglas, was enslaved at the Lockerman's plantation, but she was actually born free. So here you have kind of two interesting uh, narratives. And Anna Murray Douglas, if you don't know anything about Anna, uh, her daughter Rosetta said that um, Frederick Douglass's story was made possible by the unserving loyalty and wavering, um, unwavering of Anna Murray. And she was part of the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society and the Underground Railroad in New York. So quite a cool lady there. And she was born in, um, at the Lockerman's plantation. Um, so the city house would have been Hammond Harwood House and the country house would have been Bennett's Tolson in uh, modern day Denton, Maryland. So without further ado, I wanna introduce you to our brilliant executive director, uh, Barbara Goriat, who's been with us since I believe 2017, but prior to that, she was on our board of trustees, uh, at one time our board president. And Barbara um, was the vice president of St. John's College. So she's had a, a wonderful long history in Annapolis and she has been researching this topic for uh, quite a few years now, right, Barbara? So without further ado, I'll uh, let it, Barbara Goriat. Well, thanks. Thanks, Rachel. And welcome to all of you on this uh, icy day. And thanks for joining us at Hammond Harwood House. As we consider some of the ways we can we can listen to the voices of individuals who were enslaved in the period before and during the Civil War. As, as Rachel said, um, uh, there were enslaved people at Hammond Harwood House. And we found out a little bit about several of the women who lived here. We knew their names the sis sisters Mary and Matilda Matthews, along with a woman named Juliet. And uh, as Rachel said, um, Willa Banks will be giving a presentation um, next, next Thursday afternoon on them. Um, we can surmise the kinds of work that they did, domestic labor, 
cooking, childcare, laundry, cleaning. We do know that Mary and Matilda were sold to a slave trader in Alexandria in 1832, but they eventually gained their certificates of freedom. So we can construct a kind of rough timeline of their lives, but what they thought about, what they saw and heard every day, their hopes and their fears, uh, about all of these, we don't, we don't know anything. So um, I'm gonna share my screen because I have a little PowerPoint. I'm gonna start with, We go. So what was it like to live within the system of slavery in America? In the search for the voices of the enslaved, the search to learn about the content of their lives, I found some compelling sources. I am not a historian or a researcher, and there's a lot of material available. So I'm just going to talk about three sources that spoke to me and gave me some insight into the thoughts of these enslaved people. First are autobiographical slave narratives. Uh, Fre Frederick Douglass's writings are perhaps the best known of these. So we'll Barbara, listen. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting yes. you. Um, have you shared your screen? I, I yes, it didn't work. Can you please um, close it all together and do it from the beginning? Okay, sorry, good, thanks for telling me. So where, how come we're not working here? Let me see. Share screen. Are you letting me share the screen? Yes. Okay. It's the green. Barbara, make, make sure that your, your document is open on the desktop. There you go. It's good. It's good you now. Got it now? It's good now, yes. Okie doke, got it. Even with our rehearsal, I messed up, so. You're good, it looks great. There we go, okay. So we're at the, um, uh, the, the sources. Um, <clears throat> let's see, first our um, autobiographical slave narratives, Frederick Douglass's writings are perhaps the best known. So we'll listen to some of his words, as well as those of Harriet Jacobs, who provides a woman's perspective. Uh, second are stories of escaped men and women who came through the office of the Anti-Slavery Society in Philadelphia. Most of these people traveled on the Underground Railroad with the aim of settling in Canada or one of the northern states. And third are interviews taken in 1936 and 1937 of men and women born in slavery. This was a project of the WPA Works Progress Administration during the administration. During, I'm sorry, during the um, depression. So our time frame for the autobiographical slave narratives is the 1830s to the Civil War. These autobiographical narratives were mainly written by men and women who had escaped slavery. Through their writing and public appearances, they became representatives of the system of slavery and as such, spokesmen and women for abolitionists and others who advocated for emancipation. At this time in American history, the notion of the equality of the races was still a radical idea. These well-written, compelling narratives provided evidence for the goal of equality, as well as illustrating in sometimes frightening form, terms the conditions under which the enslaved lived in the southern and border states. White friends, often abolitionists, urged these men and women to write their stories, the narratives that would put the consequences of slaveholding in a stark light. The notion of the formerly enslaved giving voice to their own stories arose alongside the emerging philosophy of humanism and drew on the religious re reawakenings in the early 1800s. These were both important movements in um, the development of American thought in the first half of the 19th century. The authors of, of these narratives had received some education, which set them apart from the vast majority of the enslaved. Some who had worked in the slaveholders' houses rather than in the fields learned to read and write from the women of the house or from other slaves. Some were self-taught like Frederick Douglass. 
all viewed lack of education as one of the important repressions of enslavement. The writers of these narratives had the advocacy of white friends who sometimes, called, who, who sometimes were called upon to affirm the authenticity of the former slaves' authorship. We find certain themes running through these accounts. The desire for freedom. This arose in enslaved men and women for various reasons, because they longed for a life beyond the constraints and repressions of slavery. The desire to find family members they had been separated from. The desire to find their own identity and their own work. The desire to escape abuse and violence. And they fled the constant fear of being sold or of their family members being sold. Enslaved men and women who escaped exhibited personal and physical characteristics, bravery, determination. Some tried to escape numerous times, were captured and returned and punished and then tried again. They exhibited devotion to families and physical and mental and psychological stamina. They frequently committed to paying forward the help they received by going on to teach, lecture and advocate for emancipation. Many of these narratives exist. And one good source is the University of North Carolina Documents of the South website, which holds a variety of manuscripts, letters, illustrations, and books. I find these autobiographical narratives particularly interesting at this period in our history now. I'm inspired by the questions to white Americans posed by the Black Lives Matter movement. These narratives show historical significance of the barriers seen and unseen to a meaningful life for black Americans. The depth of prejudice, the widespread acceptance of inequality and white privilege. I'm gonna read from a couple of these verbatim. So it's basically story time. Note that some of the words are not what we consider now to be proper usage. I'm gonna say them anyway, um, even though that they currently have racist meanings. So let's start with Frederick Douglass. Uh, Rachel already told you a little bit about Frederick Douglass. Here's a, a portrait of him as a young man and the, uh, the title page from his, his narrative, which is called Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. Um, and they always say written by himself. And uh, this, is, uh, this house is uh, Y House over on the Eastern shore Near, um, near Easton, and that's where he um, lived as a, as a young child. So the book was published in 1845 when Douglas was 27 years old, seven years after he escaped from slavery. And he, by that time, had already been established as a lecturer in the North. He's perhaps the best known of the Blacks who escaped slavery, eloquent, lettered, and compelling. He was born in Talbot County, Maryland, but did not know the year of his birthday. Usually it's listed as 1818. His father was white, likely a slaveholder, perhaps his owner. He was separated from his mother in infancy. He lived on a farm near Easton, that's the Y House plantation of Edward Lloyd IV, where his master was Lloyd's clerk. Um, and Rachel's already described the connection with the Chase House across the street, which was the townhouse for Edward Lloyd. Douglas describes some of the most vivid scenes of brutality toward enslaved workers committed by the overseer of the overseers at Lloyd's estate, where three to 400 enslaved men and women were held. In addition to the Chase House connection to Hammond Harwood House, there's this second connection, and this is uh, Anna Murray his wife, who we think was born at uh, Bennett's Tolson. So I'm just gonna start reading uh, the beginning of his narrative. The first couple paragraphs contain many of the hallmarks of, of these, um, these uh, autobiographical accounts. There are common threads that run throughout all the stories of enslavement. So this is, this is Douglas's own words. The opinion was also whispered that my master was my father, but of the correctness of this opinion, I know nothing. The means of knowing was withheld from me. And I'll just as say as an aside, often slave children did not know their parents and mixed race offspring were very common in all across the slave holding states. 
My mother and I were separated when I was but an infant before I knew her as my mother. It's a common custom in the part of Maryland from which I ran away to part children from their mothers at a very early age. Frequently, before the child has reached its 12th month, its mother is taken from it and hired out on some farm a considerable distance off and the child is placed under the care of an old woman too old for field labor. For what this separation is done, I do not know unless it be to hinder the development of the child's affection towards its mother and to blunt and destroy the natural affection of the mother for the child. This is the inevitable result. I know of such cases and it's worthy of remark that such slaves, and here he means mixed race slaves such as himself, invariably suffer greater hardships and have more to contend with than others. They are in the first place a constant offense to the mistress this is another common theme. She is ever disposed to find fault with them. They can seldom do anything to please her. She is never better pleased than when she sees them under the lash, especially when she suspects her husband of showing his mulatto children favors which he withholds from his black slaves. The master is frequently compelled to sell this class of his slaves out of deference to the feelings of his white wife. And cruel as the deed may strike anyone to be for a man to sell his own children to human flesh mongers, it is often the dictate of humanity for him to do so. For unless he does this, he must not only whip them himself, but must stand by and see one white son tie up his brother of but a few shades darker complexion than himself and ply the gory lash to his naked back. And if he lisp one word of disapproval, it is set down to his parental partiality and only makes a bad matter worse, both for himself and the slave whom he would protect and defend. So while very young, uh, Frederick Douglass witnessed and remembered scenes of brutality, he uh, recounts one that happened when he was two years old and he kept that in his memory. Um, these made him, of course, fearful of life at the White House plantation. So he was very relieved when at the age of seven, he was sent to Baltimore to live with Hugh Ald and his wife. While in Baltimore, Douglas lived a safer life and was able to go about the city on errands. He was determined to learn how to read because for him, this symbolized um, a progress toward, toward freedom. So I'm gonna read um, a section that, that describes uh, how he learned to read. The plan which I adopted, and remember he's seven, eight years old at this point. The plan which I adopted and the one by which I was most successful was that of making friends of all the little white boys whom I met in the street. As many of these as I could, I converted into teachers. With their kindly aid obtained at different times and in different places, I finally succeeded in learning to read. When I was sent on errands, I always took my book with me, and by going one part of my errand quickly, I found time to get a lesson before my return. I used also to carry bread with me, enough of which was always in the house, and to which I was always welcome, for I was much better off in this regard than many of the poor white children in our neighborhood. This bread I used to bestow upon the hungry little urchins, who in return would give me that more valuable bread of knowledge. And I really loved this little section because it, it shows a, um, a very, very young enslaved person's, you know, strong desire to go beyond his, his life uh, that seemed like it was going to be forever at the, at the plantation on the Eastern Shore. And also the part where he gives bread to the other children and realizes that their life is also very difficult. Um, it shows a, a real grasp of the totality of humanity, I think. Seven years later, he was sent back to the Eastern Shore. And for the next six years, he was shuffled around to various Eastern Shore properties, of one of which was to um, uh, a, a plantation uh, manager who was known as a slave breaker. And basically, he just whipped everyone. Uh, Douglas experienced extreme conditions and attempted to run away several times. Finally, he did manage to escape when he was 20 years old. Um, he had gone back to Baltimore, disguised himself as a sailor, 
and uh, boarded a train that took him to Delaware and then a steamboat to Philadelphia. Next, I wanna talk about um, Harriet Jacobs. I don't know if any of you have ever, ever heard of her. Um, she lived 1813 to 1897. And I love the title of her book, which is Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by herself, edited by a woman named Lydia Maria Child, who was in her own right, uh, quite a prominent uh, feminist and um, abolitionist. The book was published in 1861. This is one of, the, um, one of the better known slave narratives and it's a harrowing story of how an enslaved woman endured years of persecu persecution and molestation at the hands of her enslaver and of her determination to escape and bring her children to freedom. Harriet, who was known as Linda Brent in her slave life, was born in Edenton, North Carolina. Her mother and father were mixed race, so she was light skinned. Her father was a carpenter who attempted to buy freedom for his wife and for Harriet and her younger brother, William. Harriet's grandmother was the daughter of a planter and the two families, the enslavers and the enslaved were intertwined over several generations. So here's an excerpt from her book. When I was six years old, my mother died. And then for the first time I learned by the talk around me that I was a slave. My mother's mistress was the daughter of my grandmother's mistress. She was the foster sister of my mother. They were both nourished at my grandmother's breast. So Harriet's mother's mistress promised that no harm would come to the two children because she was so fond of Harriet's mother. And indeed, when Harriet's mother died, that, that mistress took Harriet into her home and taught her to sew and read. A few years later, when Harriet was 11, this woman died, and Harriet hoped that she would be freed in her will. However, here's what happened, and I'll read another section. She, this mistress, possessed but few slaves, and at her death, those were all distributed among her relatives. Five of them were my grandmother's children, that is, Harriet's mother and her aunts and uncles and they had shared the same milk that nourished her mother's children, that is the mistress and her siblings. Notwithstanding my grandmother's long and faithful service to her owners, not one of her children escaped the auction block. These God-breathing machines are no more in the sight of their masters than the cotton they plant or the horses they tend. So uh, this mistress had left Harriet to her sister's five-year-old daughter. And that meant that Harriet would go live at the home of the five-year-old daughter and uh, work for her parents who were Dr. and Mrs. Flint. Um, Harriet then was, I don't know how, how to describe this, but she was harassed and she was molested by Dr. Flint for many, many years, starting from when she was very young, around 13 or 14. Here's a passage in which she describes comforting her younger brother while she herself was constantly suffering. My brother William, now 12 years old, had the same aversion to the word master that he had when he was an urchin of seven years. I was his confidant. He came to me with all his troubles. I remember one instance in particular. It was on a lovely spring morning. And when I marked the sunlight dancing here and there, its beauty seemed to mock my sadness. For my master, whose restless, craving, vicious nature roved about day and night, seeking whom to devour, had just left me with stinging, scorching words, words that scathed ear and brain like fire. Oh, how I despised him. When he told me that I was made for his use, made to obey his command in everything, that I was nothing but a slave, whose will must and should surrender to his. Never before had my puny arm felt half so strong. And here's another section, um, <clears throat> equally powerful. No matter whether the slave girl be as black as ebony or as fair as her mistress, in either case, there is no shadow of law to protect her from insult, from violence, 
or even from death. All of these are inflicted by fiends who bear the shape of men. The mistress who ought to protect the hopeless victim has no other feelings toward her but those of jealousy and rage. The degradation, the wrongs, the vices, the grow out of slavery are more than I can describe. They are greater than you would willingly believe. Surely, if you credited one half the truths that are told you concerning the helpless millions of suffering in this cruel bondage, you in the North would not help to lighten the yoke. You surely would refuse to do for the master on your own soil, the mean and cruel work which trained bloodhounds and the lowest class of whites do for him in the South. So that's her situation when she is, she's a young teenager. Uh, Dr. Flint's wife found out about his mistreatment of Harriet and uh, confronted Harriet. Harriet outlined the situation to her in generalities. And the effect of this revelation, of course, was that Mrs. Flint now hated Harriet, making her life even more miserable. And here's what she says about that. The secrets of slavery are concealed like those of the Inquisition. My master was, to my knowledge, the father of 11 slaves. But did the mothers dare to tell who was the father of their children? Did the other slaves dare to allude to it, except in whispers among themselves? No, indeed. They knew too well the terrible consequences. So once the wife found out, Dr. Flint was in you know, deep doo-doo at, at home there. And uh, his next plan was to build a little house for Harriet and have her live there by herself so that he could go um, harass her whenever he wanted. And Harriet, of course, very much feared this arrangement and she devised a plan. Okay, this sounds a little out there, but this is what she thought would happen. She decided to have an affair with another white gentleman who was kind and who promised to purchase her if possible. And here's how she describes her, her plan. I knew nothing would enrage Dr. Flint so much as to know that I favored another. And it was something to triumph over my tyrant. I thought he would revenge himself by selling me. And I was sure my friend, Mr. Sands, would buy me. Of a man who was not my master, I could ask to have my children well supported. And in this case, I felt confident I should obtain the boon. I also felt quite sure that they, the children, would be made free. With all these thoughts revolving in my mind and seeing no other way of escaping the doom I so much dreaded, I made a headlong plunge. Pity me and pardon me, O oh virtuous reader. You never know what it is to be a slave to be entirely unprotected by law or custom, to have the laws reduce you to the condition of a chattel, entirely subject to the will of another. So she began an affair with Mr. Sands and she bore him two children, but things did not play out as she had hoped. Dr. Flint constantly reminded her that because he was her owner, he also owned these children, even though they were not his children. His threats now centered on the children as well as continuing against Harriet. And she feared that he would sell those children of Mr. Sands um, to thwart her. And the only way she could think of to stop him was for her to run away. Because she was so closely watched, she knew that she had to be supremely careful about her escape. And so she hid herself to await a better time. So here's the description of how she managed that. A small shed had been added to my grandmother's house years ago. Some boards were laid across the joists at the top and between these boards and the roof was a very small garret, never occupied by anything but rats and mice. It was a pent roof covered with nothing but shingles according to the Southern custom. The garret was only nine feet long and seven feet wide. The highest part was three feet high and sloped down abruptly to the loose floorboard. There was no admission to either light or air. My uncle Philip, who was a carpenter, had very skillfully made a concealed trapdoor, which communicated with the storeroom below. To this hole, I was conveyed as soon as I entered the house. The air was stifling, the darkness total. A bed had been spread on the floor. I could sleep quite comfortably on one side but the slope was so sudden that I could not turn on the other without hitting the roof. 
the rats and mice ran over my bed. But I was weary and I slept such sleep as the wretched may. Morning came. I knew it only by the noises I heard, for in my small den, day and night were all the same. I suffered for air even more than for light, but I was not comfortless. I heard the voices of my children. So only a very few people knew where she was. The children didn't know, her grandmother and a few others. And they spread the rumor that she had escaped to New York. So Dr. Flint went several times to New York and he sent patrollers after her. Um, and meanwhile, he constantly threatened her children, relatives and friends to tell where she was. And she was very clever. She wrote letters to Dr. Flint and she had them taken to New York and mailed from there to him. So he was receiving mail from her asking about the children uh, from New York. So after a period of time, Mr. Sands was able to purchase the children. He was after all their father and he sent them north to live with relatives. At that point, Harriet knew she could, she could leave herself. And here's what she says. I hardly ex expect that the reader will credit me when I affirm that I lived in that little dismal hole, almost deprived of light and air, and with no space to move my limbs for nearly seven years. But it is a fact, and to me a sad one even now, for my body still suffers from the effects of that long imprisonment, to say nothing of my soul. Countless were the nights that I sat late in the little loophole, scarcely large enough to give me a glimpse of one twinkling star. There I heard the patrols and slave hunters conferring together about the capture of runaways, well knowing how rejoiced they would be to catch me. Well, she finally did make her escape by boat. And remember, she's in North Carolina. So it took uh, a week or so, and uh, she went to New York where she was eventually reunited with her children she, along with her daughter, became active in the equality movement, and she wrote this narrative. She traveled, she, and she taught in schools for Black children in Atlanta and Washington, D.C., and then back in New England. Her story is important because of the revelations about how enslaved women were treated. Her determination to fight against her fate, engaging in a purposeful affair with a white man, spending seven years in a cramped attic, all extraordinary. Dr. Flint's treatment of Harriet is emblematic of the sexual ex exploitation of enslaved women by white men with power over them. In addition, he introduced the threat of permanent separation from her children. And she wished a life of freedom for them, which motivated her actions as well. So the next, those were the, the uh, autobiographical narratives. So the next set of sources that um, I'm going to talk about are records that were um, gathered at the, one of the offices of the Underground Railroad, the office of the, what's it called, anti-slavery office in Philadelphia by a gentleman called William Still. So here's, here's William. And um, so these uh, um, records that he recorded um, he interviewed people who were passing through Philadelphia who had escaped on the Underground Railroad. And there were two parts to that. He wanted to find out um, you know, what their life was like in the South, what their history was, what their reason was, how they came about, how they, you know, how they managed to leave. And he also wanted to, um, to make recommendations to the Anti-Slavery Society about their future. And uh, the Anti-Slavery Society raised money to send these, these folks on to Canada. And because the, uh, the records contained um, confidential information about the routes of the Underground Railroad and the conductors, the book could not be published um, until well after the Civil War. It was published in uh, the 1870s. So the title is um, the Underground Railroad, a record of facts, authentic narrative letters, et cetera, narrating the hardships, hair breath escapes, and death struggles of the slaves in their efforts of freedom. Uh, I do wanna say a little bit about William himself. He has a very interesting story. His parents were both enslaved in Caroline County on the Eastern shore. His father was able to purchase his own freedom and left for New Jersey. 
His mother attempted to escape to join him, taking an infant in arms, a toddler, and two young sons on a harrow harrowing journey by night. However, she was captured and returned to her owner. She tried again. The second time, she only took the two younger children and she left the two boys who were, you know, nine, 10 years old behind with the thought that they were better able to care for themselves until a plan could be made to retrieve them. So she and her husband stayed in New Jersey for, for, for many years. They had 14 more children and William was the youngest. So the two boys left behind were sold numerous times and they ended up in the deep south. The older one, Levin, died as a result of injuries from being whipped. The other, Peter, escaped with his wife and reached Philadelphia, where he decided to search for members of his family. This was 40 years after his mother had had to leave him behind in Maryland. In search of records about his family members, he visited the anti-slavery office where he met William who worked there recording the stories. They soon realized that they were brothers. And so that was a stunning reunion after so many years had passed. What should we know about these records of William Stills? Um, he had developed a set of questions based um, for each entry, uh, but he didn't necessarily stick to just the facts about each individual story. He was interested in their motives the dangers they faced and the conditions they lived under in slavery. Um, and as I said, he, he made recommendations for, uh, for the next steps in their future. Here's a, a little bit from his introduction, tells about his aims. It was, however, one of the most gratifying facts connected with the fugitives, the strong love and attachment that they constantly expressed for their relatives left in the South. The undying faith they had in God is evinced by their touching appeals on behalf of their fellow slaves. But few probably are aware how deeply these feelings were cherished in the breasts of this people. 40, 50, or 60 years in some instances elapsed, but this ardent sympathy and love continued warm and unwavering as ever. Children left to the cruel mercy of slaveholders could never be forgotten. Brothers and sisters could not refrain from weeping over the remembrance of their separation on the auction block, of having seen innocent children, feeble and defenseless women in the grasp of a merciless tyrant. Not to remember those thus bruised and mangled, it would seem alike unnatural and impossible. Therefore, it's a source of great satisfaction to be able in relating these heroic escapes to present the evidences of the strong affections of this greatly oppressed race. So I'm gonna read you um, a couple of the entries that he wrote about people. So here's one, Harriet Shepard and her five children with five other passengers. Um, and this is a very cool uh, engraving that accompanied uh, this account. And this is, this is what uh, Still wrote. One morning about the 1st of November in 1855, the sleepy slaveholding neighborhood of Chestertown, Maryland was doubtless deeply excited on learning that 11 head of slaves, four head of horses and two carriages were missing. Harriet Shepard, the mother of five children for whom she felt of course a mother's love could not bear the thought of having her offspring compelled to wear the miserable yoke of slavery as she had been compelled to do. By her own personal experience, Harriet could very well judge what their fate would be when reaching man and womanhood. She declared that she had never received kind treatment herself, but it was not on this account that she prompt, was prompted to escape. She was actuated by a more disinterested motive than this. She was chiefly induced to make the bold effort to save her children from ha having to drag the chains of slavery as she herself had done. Anna Maria, Edwin, Eliza Jane, Mary Ann, and John Henry were the names of the children for whom she was willing to make any sacrifice. They were young and unable to walk a long distance, and she was penniless and unable to hire a conveyance, even if she had known any who could have been willing to risk the law in taking them on a night's journey. So there was no hope in these directions. Her rude intellect being considered, 
She was entitled to a great deal of credit for seizing the horses and carriages belonging to her master, as she did it for the liberation of her children. Knowing others at the same time who were wanting to visit Canada, she consulted with five of this class, males and females, and they mutually decided to travel together. It's not likely that they knew much about the roads. Nevertheless, they reached Wilmington, Delaware, pretty direct. Well, you know, if you know the geography of the Eastern Shore, Chestertown is not that far from, from Delaware. So um, they did this uh, over, over one night and they ventured to the heart of the town in carriages, looking as innocent as if they were going to meeting to hear an old fashioned Southern sermon on servants obey your masters. Of course, the distinguished travelers were immediately reported to the notice, noted Thomas Garrett, who was accustomed to transact the affairs of the Underground Railroad in a cool and masterly way. After receiving friendly aid and advice while there, they were forwarded to the committee in Philadelphia. Here, further aid was afforded them, and as danger was quite obvious, they were completely divided and disguised so that the committee felt they might safely be sent onto Canada in one of the regular trains. Considering the condition of the slave mother and her children and friends, all concerned rejoiced that they had had the courage to use their master's horses and vehicles as they did. And here's one more story that uh, was included in, um, uh, in uh, William Still's uh, record book. Um, this one um, includes the uh, escaped slave notice that ran in the Baltimore newspapers um, from Elliot Burwell of West River, which is near, obviously near Galesville in Southern Anne Arundel County. So Still says, Harry reached the, it was Harry Wise is the name of the runaway. 1857 is the year. Harry reached the station in Philadelphia in the latter part of August. His excuse for leaving and seeking a habitation in Canada was as follows. And here he quotes the escaped enslaved person. I was treated monstrous bad. My master was a very cross crabbed man and his wife was as cross as he was. The day I left, they had to tie me to beat me about what I could not tell. This is what made me leave. I escaped right out of his hands the day he had me. He was going with me to the barn to tie me across a hogshead, but I broke loose from him and ran. He ran and got his gun to shoot me, but I soon got out of his reach and I have not seen him since. Harry might never have found the Underground Railroad, but for this deadly onslaught upon him by his master, his mind was wrought up to a very high state of earnestness and he was deemed a very fitting subject for Canada. So these entries of William Stills include many harrowing accounts. I couldn't stop reading them actually. Um, slaves traveling in winter, wading through icy rivers, um, falling asleep, um, having spent the night in a forest, waking near daybreak with nothing to eat, um, women hiding in crates aboard ships bound north, tales of family members left behind, runaways being chased by patrollers' hounds, um, people hiding in, tree, in a tree for hours, um, and William still treats all of these people with respect and admiration for their courage. Of one group of travelers who arrived in his office, he wrote, the spirit of freedom so natural to man was uppermost with them. And uh, so the last uh, source of um, enslaved voices I want to talk about. Um, I had no idea about this collection of documents, so I was really fascinated to find it. Um, it's called Born in Slavery, Slave Narratives from the Federal Writers Project, 1936 to 1938. The material from this interesting WPA project, it's on the Library of Congress website. The idea was that Depression era unemployed writers could be sent to interview and write up first person accounts of men and women who had been born in slavery. So this was 70 years after emancipation. So the interviewees, the people, um, the people who were born in slavery were at that point um, more than 80 and some of them claimed to be over a hundred. 
There are 22 accounts from people uh, living in Maryland at the time, and I've drawn material from those. The project actually ranged over all of the slaveholding states. The interviewers worked from a set of questions about folklore, traditions, food and leisure activities, the conditions of slavery, and other things. These are really not likely to be the kinds of questions we would focus on today. The emphasis then was more on folklore than on social conditions or the physical and psychological effects of slavery. The attitudes of the interviewers also were the attitudes of people from the 1930s. And note that these accounts also contain language that we no longer use and now consider racist. Uh, we should think about the filters here. Um, the white, mostly male interviewers represented the government to these former slaves. This could have created a sense of weariness. Some interviewees obviously just wanted to please, and they only conveyed positive information about their past, while others dwelt on more realistic memories. Recollection of the past is a highly subjective phenomenon. This type of documentation can be considered untrustworthy by historians. And in truth, um, the accounts are often confusing and with the biases of the times built in, we need to keep the stories in perspective. Remember most of the children, most of the interviewees were still children when they were held as slaves, but uh, it's a valuable resource because we can gain some insight into the cultural and social setting of the community of the enslaved, as well as the everyday experience of slavery. The editor of the Library of Congress project, B.A. Botkin writes, beneath all the contradictions and exaggerations, the fantasy and flattery, the interviews possess an essential truth and humanity. So there's two that I wanna talk about, or no, I think there's three actually, um, and so let me explain the pictures on this slide. Um, I looked, the, the, um, the collection includes a number of really nice photographs, but there are no photographs of um, people from Maryland. So um, most of them are actually from Georgia and Texas. That must be where they sent the photographers. But I did choose two just because they are such nice photos um, that are representative of the, um, the uh, formerly enslaved folks who were, were interviewed in this project. And here's what the, um, what the pages look like that, that are on the Library of Congress website. It's just the, the typescript from the old typewriters in the 1930s, um, collected one page after another. And um, this house I'll, I'll talk about as part of one of the stories. So I wanna read the first um, interview. This is um, Caroline Hammond. She was interviewed at her home um, on Falls Road in Baltimore in 1936. I was born in Anne Arundel County near Davidsonville, about three miles from South River in the year 1844. The daughter of a free man and a slave woman who was owned by Thomas Davidson, a slave owner and farmer of Anne Arundel. Okay, so um, this is Davidson's house. It is still there. It's um, on the corner of Central Avenue and Davidsonville Road and it's right opposite Homestead Gardens. It's the big house that's there. So that's where, that's where yes. Let's do uh, questions in the, um, in the chat, okay? Um, that's where she was, she was born and, um, and lived. There were about 25 slaves on this farm, all of whom lived in small huts with the exception of several of the household help who ate and slept in the manor house. My mother, being one of the household slaves, enjoyed certain privileges that the farm slaves did not. She was the head cook of Mr. Davidson's household. Mr. Davidson and his family were considered people of high social standing in Annapolis. Mr. Davidson entertained on a large scale, especially many of the officers of the Naval Academy of Annapolis and his friends from Baltimore. Mrs. Davidson's dishes were considered the finest and to receive an invitation from the Davidsons meant that you would enjoy Maryland's finest terrapin and chicken besides the best wine and champagne on the market. All of the cooking was supervised by my mother. I think it's very sweet. She's, she's just so very proud of her mother's abilities in this kitchen. Mr. Davidson was, a very good, was very good to his slaves. 
treating them with every consideration that he could with the exception of freeing them. But Mrs. Davidson was hard on all the slaves. Whenever she had the opportunity, driving them at full speed when working, giving different food of a coarser grade and not much of it. She was the daughter of one of the revels of the county, a family whose reputation was known all over Maryland for their brutality with their slaves. Mother, with the consent of Mr. Davidson, married George Berry, a free colored man of Annapolis, with a proviso that he was to purchase mother within three years after marriage for $750. And if any children were born, they were to go with her. My father was a carpenter by trade and his services were much in demand. He had plenty of work doing repair and building. Father paid Mr. Davidson for mother on the partial payment, payment plan. He had paid up all but $40 on mother's account. When by accident, Mr. Davidson was shot while ducking on the South River by one of the duck hunters and he died instantly. Mrs. Davidson assumed full control of the farm and the slaves. When father wanted to pay off the balance due, $40, Mrs. Davidson refused to accept it. Thus, mother and I were to remain in slavery. Being a free man, father had the privilege to go where he wanted to, provided he was endorsed by a white man. By bribery of the sheriff of Anne Arundel County, father was given a passage to Baltimore for mother and me. On arriving in Baltimore, Mother, father, and I went to a white family on Ross Street, which is now Druid Hill Avenue, where we were sheltered by the occupants who were ardent supporters of the Underground Railroad. Eventually, they made their way to Pennsylvania, concealed in a large wagon. Both parents found work there. Caroline herself became a cook, married, and lived surrounded by her children and grandchildren. And she is 95 years old when she's interviewed. Caroline's free father was bilked out of his payments to the slaveholder family. He had worked to unite his family and free his wife and child. So the desire for freedom, especially in the face of separation of family units or because of mistreatment by slaveholders, which could be physical, economic, or psychological, all of these were effective means of subjugation. So I'm gonna read another one. I don't have any illustrations to go with this. This is um, James Wiggins who was interviewed at his home in Baltimore. He was also born in Anne Arundel County on a, form, on a farm near West River uh, around 1850 or 1851. He did not know his father or mother. So I'm gonna quote now from his interview. Peter Brooks, one of the oldest colored men in the county, told me that my father's name was Wiggins. He said that he was one of the rebels slaves. No, this is the same family that we referred to in the previous account. Um, Revel uh, was um, uh, Mrs. Davidson's family. She came, she came from the Revels. He acquired my father at an auction sale held in Baltimore at a high price from a trader who had an office on Pratt Street in around 1845. He was given a wife, a wife by Mr. Revel, and as a result of this union, I was born. My father was a carpenter by trade. He was hired out to different farmers. I've been told that my father could read and write. Once he was charged with writing passes for some slaves in the county. As a result of this, he was giving, given 15 lashes by the sheriff. Immediately afterwards, he ran away, went to Philadelphia, where he died while working to save money to purchase mother's freedom through a white Baptist minister in Baltimore. So this account again illustrates the very common separation of families. Also note that his lack of knowledge, also note his lack of knowledge about his birth year, his birth date, and his parents. These are foundational pieces of self-identity denied to many enslaved children. The rest of his story is that after Revel died, Wiggins at age 10 was sold to a shopkeeper in Annapolis, then sold again to a slave trader to be shipped to Georgia. He was brought to Baltimore and jailed in a small house on Pecos Street. But before the slave trader could gather enough merchandise for a shipload, Wiggins escaped with the aid of a German shoemaker who sold shoes made for the enslaved. He was taken to Frederick where he stayed until emancipation. So I think I just have one more and this is a, this is a quick one. 
This is the Reverend Silas Jackson, who was interviewed at his home in Baltimore. Um, he was born in Ashby's Gap, Virginia in 1846 or 1847. And here's his account. My master was named Tom Ashby. A meaner man was never born in Virginia, brutal, wicked, and hard. He always carried a cowhide with him. If he saw anyone doing something that he did not, did not suit his taste, he would have the slave tied to a tree, man or woman, and then would cowhide the victim. The Ashby home was a large stone mansion with a porch on three sides. Mrs. Ashby was kind and lovely to her slaves when Mr. Ashby was out. I've heard it said by people in authority that he owned 9,000 acres of farm besides woodland. He was a large slave owner having more than 100 slaves on his farm. They were awakened by blowing of the horn before sunrise by the overseer, started work at sunrise and worked all day till sundown with no time to go to cabin for dinner. You carried your dinner with you. The slaves were driven at top speed and whipped the snap of a finger by the overseers. I've heard it said that Tom Ashby's father went to one of the cabins late at night and the slaves were having a secret prayer meeting. He heard one slave ask God to change the heart of his master and deliver him from slavery so that he may enjoy freedom. That slave disappeared, never seen again. When old man Ashby died, just before he died, he told the white Baptist minister that he had killed Zeke for praying and that he was going to hell. Well, we, we don't know the rest of the Reverend Jackson's story, but I guess we can infer from his title that he became a preacher. It seems fitting to end here with an unfinished story as the stories of most of the more than 4 million enslaved in the American South were not told. I hope listening to these excerpts from slave narratives and interviews has given you a better idea of what a few of the enslaved experienced thought and felt. One of my own takeaways from listening to these voices is that the practices of slavery denied the development and confirmation of self-identity. The enslaved did not know their own birth date. Some did not know their parents or their brothers and sisters. They lived with a constant threat of being sold. The most basic of human needs were undermined. Closeness of friends and family, security, home, self-worth from work or relationships, adequate food, shelter, clothing, education, religious or spiritual connection, all were denied. From voices of the enslaved captured in these narratives and account, we get a picture of the heart's desires that were denied as a result of the institution of slavery. So we'll end there. And I don't know if we have a little bit of time, we can take some questions in the, in the chat. This presentation will be available to everybody afterwards. How, how do we get it if we want to see it again? I think Eleni will provide a, a link. Okay. Yeah. Eleni, can you give a link? Uh, yes, yes, everyone will uh, receive the recording, um, if not today, tomorrow morning, once it's ready. Yeah, do we have any questions, comments? Yes, I had a question. Okay. Um, is it getting any easier to do uh, research um, with African Americans heritage? I think that there are many sources available. I think one of the issues is that, um, you know, historians, real historians like actual documentation. And there is so little actual documentation of the enslaved. So there are no birth records, no birth certificates, no death records, no marriage records. Um, you know, at most you get, you know, an accounting in some slave owner's will, list of names and values or something like that. So that's one of the barriers. Um, but I do think that the, uh, the community of historians is opening up a little bit in terms of the type of material that's considered um, 
you know, uh, solid enough for, for research. And, um, you know, it's just always the case and it's just hard, you know, to, to, find, to find material. Um, I was really happy to find these three things and there really is a lot, but you have to realize each one has a certain set of circumstances connected with it. Um, I think the, the slave narratives are, yes, they are first person accounts, they're autobiographical, they were written by people who were enslaved themselves, but they're also pieces of propaganda. They were used by the abolitionists to convince. And, you know, it's not saying that what's in them isn't true, but you have to keep in mind that was their purpose. And the same with some of the other, um, the other pieces, you know, the WPA interviews, um, they were very interested in folklore traditions. Um, you know, I kind of filtered out anything that had to do with, um, with magic or with superstitions and things like that, because I was more interested in the, you know, the psychological profile of the, of the, uh, the interviewees. But um, yeah, I, there, there is a lot of material and I think there's a lot of interest in uncovering more and more material. I understand, uh, I went to um, a genealogy workshop last year before the COVID and uh, there was someone talking about doing research using um, places like Ancestry.com and those things. Yes, and, yes. And yeah. how, how helpful has that been to uh, people like you doing this research or is it more just for the families? I don't know that much about um, May I make a suggestion? Yeah. Um, the uh, archives has a slavery project, which is he held, he headed by Chris Haley. And there's just so much information on the, um, the uh, archives website. So if you want to do some research, that's a good place to start. Yeah, they have all the emancipation records and, and you know, things like that. Um, you know, it's hard because sometimes the enslaved people would change their name after they became free. So you, you don't know whether you're gonna connect. And then sometimes um, there are many people with the same last name, so you don't know whether it's the right one, but that's correct. There is a ton of information. And there, I really thought that this um, website at the University of North Carolina had a lot of um, original sources, more than I had seen other places. Well, um, I'd just like to add to that, some of the things that, are, that um, Chris Haley has researched, and I, I volunteered in this project, was to uh, name the, uh, the people who had escaped uh, from slavery and who were uh, put into the prisons, the prison that opened in Baltimore in, the eight, in 1810, I think it was. And so many of them uh, you know, were, were injured. They had identifying marks in them from, uh, from horrible um, whippings and uh, from their work. And it's just, uh, uh, it's just horrible. So you know, there are just all kinds of resources like that. Uh, at the archives. Yeah, thank you. So Barbara, it looks like we have some questions in the chat and I'll, I'll field those two if that sounds good. Um, the first one comes to us from Linda. She says, it's a rather specific question. Um, are you aware of slaveholders on the Broadneck Peninsula, you know, in Anne Arundel County? I have not researched that. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are. <laughs> Yeah, that was mostly farmland over there in Arnold. Yes. And yeah, yes. so that there certainly probably was. Yes. Okay. Um, do you know if William Still's book is available digitally? Yes, it is actually. That It's on the, um, where did I see it? I mean, I think if you just type it into Google, um, you can find it. I think I found it on the Gutenberg, it's a Gutenberg book, you know, so it's um, it's available that way. And it might also be on the North Carolina site. I'm not sure. Um, that question came to us from Mary. Hi, Mary. She's the, um, the site manager at Montpelier Man Mansion in Laurel. I'm on the collections committee. Um, how is this information used at your museum? Um, in giving a Zoom lecture on a snow <laughs> Thursday. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we are trying to, we do have a new um, slavery exhibit that we opened at unfortunately, like, you know, a couple of days before we had to close because of the pandemic. Um, so not that many people have, have seen it, but we have done a fair amount of research and you'll learn more about that if you tune in next week to, um, to um, Willow Banks. Um, and we do, we are trying to incorporate um, 
as much information as we can into our normal tours of the of the house and we are giving some special presentations also about um, African American history and um, you know things like things like this. It's a great question because um, you know those people are um, they're silent in our history and uh, you know what their life was like every day. We can't you know we we just don't have much of an idea and uh, that was one of the things that motivated me thinking about those the women who worked at Hammond Harwood House. What you know when they woke up in the morning what what were they facing? I think it's it's also certainly helped um, the way that I write object labels. Um, I look at the whole history of the object and how they would have been used, and you know the whole centrality of of enslavement. I think is something now that's much more on our our, our minds, and very, we're very conscious about including that narrative. Um, within the context of the museum. So let's see what else we got going on here. I'm trying to, um, this is from Kathy. I'm trying to figure out how the lady with the carriage got from Chestertown to Philadelphia without crossing the water. I do not know. I thought about that same question. It doesn't, it doesn't say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Uh, a lot of people are saying wonderful presentation. Um, a lot of people, one or two people said about the WPA interviews. They thought that was really cool. Uh, let's see here. Do you know, this comes um, from Mr. Hobbs. Uh, do you know if the circumstances of the enslaved changed much between 1700 and emancipation? Emancipation, well, you know what I'm trying to say, emancipation. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think one of the things that interests me is the difference between the life of an enslaved person on a rural plantation versus the life of an enslaved person in an urban area. And I think those were very different kinds of lives. You could really see that with Frederick Douglass, that when he was in Baltimore, um, he had a lot more freedom to go outside the home and do errands and see and kind of communicate with other people. Um, he also later, um, before he escaped, learned a trade in, in Baltimore. And um, certainly the, the women who worked at Hammond Harwood House had a different kind of life than, um, you know, their relatives who might have been enslaved on a, on a plantation might have. Um, in, other, in terms of the, um, you know, the progress of time, I don't know the answer to that. Of certainly there were different sets of laws that were instituted at different points. Um, for instance, I think, you know, the, um, the uh, Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 really um, kind of changed the, um, changed the, the atmosphere to be more charged um, because, um, uh, you know, then, then escaped slaves were pursued in the North and that was hanging over the head of anyone who was considering leaving the South to go to the north that they could then be recaptured in the north and sent back. Um, things like the um, Nat Turner's rebellion that changed um, life for the enslaved population, I think, because it, uh, it, it made uh, slave owners more afraid and they clamped down harder on um, any kinds of, um, you know, uh, uh, any kinds of freedoms that they had, you know, might have been already granting their slaves. So things like that, you know, I'd, I don't have a good sense of otherwise things other than with those specific kinds of uh, activities. Okay, it looks like Allison has a question. Allison, you're muted. You're, you're still muted, Allison. Are, am I? Thank okay. you. Barbara, I was wondering, have you or anyone at Hammond Harvard House had the opportunity to run down the descendants of the Lockermans and see if there are any primary documents that would give you any information about Mary Matilda or Juliet? Well, I think you'll hear more about that next week. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, um, and uh, we actually had uh, a history PhD student, Chris Milkey, working on that over a number of summers as an intern at Hammond Harwood House. And he and Rachel have discovered a number of things and, and Willa will expand on that. Um, 
it's not as much information as we want. And we only know three names and we know that there were as many sometimes as five to seven enslaved people. So we don't know who the other ones were. Um, it's possible that um, some of them came from Richard Lockerman's plantation on the Eastern shore that he brought them over. Um, it's possible that some were kind of on loan from uh, Hester's um, mother, uh, you know, the J Jeremiah Chase's wife on King George Street. So we, we really don't know how that dynamic all worked. So there are some primary documents like diaries and things. There's like no that. diaries. There's a, um, a couple of letters with very brief references. There are some legal documents because there were a number of legal issues that were involved with these enslaved people. Mm -hmm. I believe that um, Chris located the um, certificates of freedom for some of them. Thank you. I have a um, question, Barbara. I don't know if you can answer it, but I'm trying to represent um, enslaved people in the curriculum work that I do and the review work that I do. And I recently saw um, an exhibit that I was working with that uh, was including enslaved people and they only had their first names. So they just listed six or eight uh, first names. And I, I don't know. So I'm, I'm looking to you for some support this way. For me, it felt like it was a very trite way to uh, identify people. I, I do realize that often they only, we only had their first names, but I'm wondering if it's more appropriate just to say that we know that there were eight enslaved people living in, in the house that were both women, men, and children, or would it be, um, more inclusive by actually writing the names. I don't know, I guess, I'm not sure I really have an opinion on that. Um, certainly if we know the first name, it seems um, that we should say that, so, you know, say their names. Mm -hmm. um, um, most of them, you know, at least according to the things I've seen, many did not know who their parents were um, and in terms of a last name, was it a made up last name? Was it the name of their owner? You know, who knows where the last name came from? Um, and many of them took new names when they, right after emancipation. So I don't know what I think about that, but I, I've seen the same thing. I've seen a number of displays that just have the first names and, and that's what you have in the documents. You know, that's what you have in the, in the will or the, um, or in the slave tax account, you, you just mm -hmm. have the first name. Thank you. Yeah. Bonnie also says, I think the names makes it more personal and that's all they had. Let them have an identity, albeit limited. It adds up to the whole picture. Good. It's very interesting with enslaved names. You'll find a lot of them have uh, references to classical antiquity like Juba or Cato or something like that, because that was the way that um, our early American founding fathers in a way justified uh, slavery as they based it on uh, classical antiquity where 30% of the population in America was enslaved and 30% of ancient Greece and Rome, well, um, well, ancient Rome specifically was enslaved. And so our founding fathers were really looking towards ancient Greece and kind of justifying it um, that way and they used uh, those names it's, it's very interesting you could do a whole study on enslaved uh, names is carol wanted to say something carol you're muted yep oh go ahead oh okay um judy asked a question and it came i believe only to me so i would like to convey her question to you it's what happened to the enslaved people at hammond harwood after the third 13th Amendment was passed. Well, I think they were all gone by then anyway. I don't know, Rachel, you might know more about yeah. it. See, I mean, for, yeah. By 1850, there are no enslaved people listed at Hammond Harwood House. So um, they might have had 
fee free uh, people of color working for them. But you know, I suppose that particular um, amendment wouldn't have affected them one way or the other. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Um, it's been an interesting project for me, and I'm going to keep going with it. And if anybody has any good tidbits to send me, certainly don't hesitate. So thank you all.